أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters and uh, welcome to another episode of our Tafsir of Dua Kumail podcast in the previous episode we ended with this line in which Imam Ali uh, used a very particular wording to explain this very beautiful point that he's trying to make. He said, Yaman bada akhalqi wa dhikri wa tarbiyati wa birri wa taqviyati. You are the one who started my creation, right? And essentially we explain this uh, also going through the dua arafah of our third imam. We explain that the point that Imam Ali is making here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings, his remembrance of us, him thinking of us, his, his goodness towards us, it all started before we even asked for it, right? So essentially, it's like we didn't even ask for it. And before we could even think of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started to bless us. That's the point that Imam Ali was making here. And we went through the uh, dua of uh, Arafah from the third Imam, where he goes into much more detail, right? Now in uh, Dua Kumail we have خَلْقِ وَذِكْرِ وَتَرْبِيَةِ وَبِرِّ وَتَغْذِيَةِ That's five. But in the Dua uh, of Arafah, it goes into much more details, right? That, Ya Allah, you're the one who created me from a drop of fluid. You had a place for me even though I was in the midst of blood and flesh and skin, right? In the wombs of, of, of people, in the bodies of people of previous generations. لَمْ تُشْهِدْنِ خَلْقِي I didn't witness any part of my creation. وَلَمْ تَجْعَلْ إِلَيَّ شَيْئًا مِنْ أَمْرِي And I didn't have to take on any responsibility for my creation. You took care of all of this, right? And then the dua continued, right? You, you were the one who gave me the food, right? The nutrition to be able to grow. And you were the one who made the people around me kind towards me. And you were the one who put the burden of raising me on, on my mother in the sense of like you made her kind towards me. Right? So we went through all of this, and then after all of this, he says, So all of these different blessings that we just mentioned happen before we even knew who God was, before we could even raise our hands and ask for any of these blessings to be sent down upon us. So going back to Dua Kumail, he said, Yaman Bada'a, you're the one who started all of this. Now he's going to take a point from this. He's going to take a conclusion from this. He's going to use this point in the next line. He says this, Habni libtida'i karamika wa salifi birrika bi. Ya Allah, you see how I told you how you did all of these things before I could even, you know, be intelligent enough to ask you for these different blessings? In other words, did you see how you gave me all of this mercy and these blessings before I was even worthy of it, right? Now, the same way you've done that in the past, now do that again now. The same way in the past you have given me blessings before I've even asked you for them, before I was even worthy of receiving that blessing from you. Today also, habni, right? give me these blessings, because of the way you are, what is the way he is and how does he do things? The fact that he gives even when you're not worthy of it. The fact that he gives even when technically you haven't even asked for it yet. Right? So essentially he's saying the same way you've done that in the past, right? You can do it now too. Like for example, when you look at someone who's, who's very, uh, you know, very generous, right? Sometimes people will approach them from this perspective. You know, you've helped people in the past who have wronged you. Why don't you help me again? This time help me even though I have technically wronged you, for example. So this is what Imam Ali is saying here. Habni libtida ikaramik. You you give me blessings today because of the fact that you started this generosity even before I was worthy of it. And because of the fact that you have been giving me blessings, right? You have a reputation of giving me these blessings. So this is the point that Imam Ali was trying to get when he said, Yaman Bada'a, the one who started before I even asked for it. Well, Bismillah, now I'm not worthy of it either, but you will still continue to bless me, inshallah. All right. So moving on with the dua, Ya ilahi wa sayyidi wa rabbi, my lord, my master, aturaka mu'adhibi binarika ba'da tawheedik, can you really see yourself punishing me 
after I have professed to your unity. Okay, now these next, uh, I want to say, four or five lines, and, and, and this concept is going to be pointed out and, and, and touched on again as we continue through the draw, is going to be, I'm going to explain what the whole point of these four or five lines are, right? But essentially, the imam is talking about a person who has done wrong and now has repented. What we do know is that a person who does wrong things and he doesn't repent, there is a, you know, a... a, a uh, <clears throat> there is a essentially there are statements essentially mentioning that this person is going to be punished right that's why we call those sins sins because when you look at the sin they come with a certain punishment in Quran or Hadith, right? But this is talking about a person who has sinned in the past, but now he is coming to do tawbah. The Imam is saying, are you really not going to accept the tawbah of this person? That's what he's saying. But he's saying it in this way, that are you going to be punishing this person, essentially, which is essentially the same thing. So he says, can you really see yourself punishing me بعد tawhidik? After I have professed to your unity, and after my heart has, you know, taken in the knowledge of who you are, after I've gotten to know who you are, and how my tongue has remembered you, and how your love has made its way into who I am, right? After all of this, are you still going to end up you know, punishing someone like me. Okay. And after I came to you and I confessed, right? And I admitted to the things that I have done. And I prayed to you and I supplicated to you. Okay. And then the next line says this. He says, no, hayhat. Hayhat essentially means it's something is far from somebody, right? You know, you've, we've heard that line of the third imam, hayhat min dhilla, means humiliation is far away from us, right? Or let it be far away from us. Hayhat means such a type of conduct in this line of the dua. He's saying this type of conduct, you punishing someone after they come and ask for, for, for your forgiveness, this is far from you. This is not the type of, uh, type of action that you do. Now, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if someone comes to them, comes to him and asks for forgiveness, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive that person. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you will find in these lines and in the, in the lines that come later on, maybe six or seven lines further into the dua, that Imam Ali is speaking more from the perspective of, are you going to punish this person? Right? Or do you see yourself punishing this person? Okay, now there is a reason for that. There's a reason why Ali ibn Abi Talib is speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and saying, Is there a chance that you will still punish this person? Right? Essentially, we know that when someone, as I mentioned, asks for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive that person. Right? We have that in the verses of the Quran as well. But why is it Imam Ali is speaking of this as if he's not sure of this promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why is he talking about it as a, you know, he's asking questions, right? Why is he asking it in a question format? Shouldn't it just be that, yes, if someone comes to you after doing toba, you will accept their toba and they will be forgiven? Technically, that's how it is. Why is Imam Ali putting it in a, a putting a maybe before all of this? So we're going to get to that in just a point. Okay, so he says... Ya Allah, do you see yourself punishing this person who has all of these different attributes? He has professed to your tawheed. He knows who you are. His tongue has remembered you, right? And your love has made its way into his heart. And he has even confessed, right? And he has admitted to his mistakes. And he has supplicated to you while he was humble. No, you wouldn't do this. It's a very beautiful, uh, you know, argue. Uh, it's a very beautiful argument that the that the Imam is making here. Okay, so he says, no, I don't think you would do that. Why? 
because this is his reasoning for that, right? He says, "Anta akramu min an man rabbayta." You're more generous than to take somebody that you nurtured with your own hands, in my wording, right? And then to ruin them and squander them and have them perish. It doesn't make sense with how generous you are. It doesn't make sense for you. You're not the type of person, right? You're not the type of being that would take someone and bring him closer to himself only to push him away the moment he makes a mistake, the moment he does something wrong, even though technically he is worthy of that. You're not the type of person who would kick somebody out, right? Who would drive someone away that you had earlier on gave, given refuge to. Or to take that person and put him through bala and difficulty, right? Even though beforehand you were protecting him, right? Even though beforehand you were sparing him from this difficulty. So what the Imam is essentially saying is this. He says, me and you, we have this history with one another, right? Us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We have this history with each other. You have helped me in the past. In fact, the very fact that I'm alive right now, right? And I'm and I'm speaking to you and I'm asking for forgiveness is all because throughout these years and days and throughout my whole life, you've been the one who's protected me all the way to this point. So you know, this wording I'm going to use and this, this approach I'm going to use is something that human beings can relate to very easily. And so it doesn't apply to God exactly the same way it applies to us because he is God. But just bear with me. He's saying, because you have essentially invested in me throughout these years, you have been kind to me, you've been generous to me, right? You've brought me closer. It doesn't make sense for you to take all of that investment that you made and just ruin it, right? So to give an example and just to clarify what the imam is actually trying to say here, you can see this with parents a lot of times. So with parents, when their child does something wrong, right? And of course, there, there are extremes, this concept that I'm talking about. But when a parent sees that their child has done something wrong, the first time it's not a problem, the second time, third time. By the tenth time, the people around that parent, the people around the mother or the father, right? They get fed up with the child. And by the 15th time, the the people around that parent will turn to the parent and say, you know what, it's over. Like there's no more hope in him. He's not going to change, right? He's just going to be the same. Um, there's no more him coming back to, you know, what he's supposed to do, coming back to the right path. They give up on him, right? And if he were to come and ask for forgiveness from them, if he were to need something from them, right? What would they say? They would say, "No, no, no. You're you're not the type of person. You're not you're not a good person. So we're not going to help you out. It's just going to go to waste." Okay. But on the other hand, the parents, the father or the mother, because they have invested sweat and blood and tears into this child, right? They are going to continue to be there for the child. While everyone else is walking away, everyone else is disappointed in this child, because this mother or father have worked so hard to raise this child, they have worked so hard, they've invested time and tear and effort and their own mercy and their own heart into this child, because they've been doing that their whole life, they can't just take it and throw it away. If this child makes 20 different mistakes, right? they're still going to be there when the child comes knocking on their door. Now, of course, when I'm talking about there, there might be extremes of this. You might have parents who, who can't even tell their children that what they're doing is wrong. And that's another problem we have. And then we also have parents who can't tell their children that, you know, even one of the things that they're doing is right. So we have extremes when it comes to this issue of parenting. And that's not, of course, the topic that we want to go into. It's important, of course, for our parents to find a balance in all of that. But anyways, the point is that a parent, because he has worked so hard, he has invested so much time, effort, kindness, tears, sweat, and, and his whole heart and his kindness into this child, he's not going to give up on this child so easily. This is what Imam Ali is saying. And of course, I mentioned at the beginning that this doesn't apply 100% to God the same way it applies to us, right? Because when we invest in something, if we lose it, then we've actually lost something. With God, he doesn't lose things, right? But his kindness and mercy is still there. In other words, the imam is saying, 
you're not going to turn away from me just because of one mistake or two mistakes or any mistake I make. If I come and ask for forgiveness, you're going to forgive me. Why? Because you're the one who has had mercy on me from the very beginning. You wouldn't take this being that you have spent so much mercy on, right? And just throw him away, right? And get rid of him because of some mistakes that he has made. No, you're going to take him. You're going to patch up his, his flaws, his deficiencies when he asks for forgiveness. And then you're going to bring him closer to you again. So this is what Imam Ali is saying uh, in these lines. Moving on with the du'a. says, I, I really want to know my, my master, my, my Lord. Are you really going to take fire, right? And have this fire basically take over the faces of those who have done sajda for you. Again, you find Imam Ali is speaking in the format of a question. Again, it's a maybe. Are you really going to do this? Okay. Now, before we continue with these lines, he says that these are faces that have fallen to sajda for you. Okay. This I want to just touch on the concept of sajda before we go through all of these lines. Uh, and we actually answer that main question that we still haven't gotten to answering, which is, why is Imam asking this in a maybe? Of course, God would not put someone in fire if they ask for forgiveness. But why is Imam Ali saying this in, in the format of a maybe? So we'll get to that in just a second. But it's very beautiful that from the first thing that he says is, a face who has fallen to sajda uh, for you out of its great, out of your greatness, right? Are you really going to burn that face? Why sajda? See, the concept of sajda, and this is something that is discussed in depth and in detail when we talk about the concept of salat. So when you look at the book of our, the books of our scholars, you will find that they've talking about the concept of sajda in particular uh, quite a bit, okay? Because this concept of sajda carries a lot of weight, has a lot of value, right? So what scholars say is that out of all of salat, it's the sajda that is the ultimate and the closest point a servant can be towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's actually a hadith. Hadith says that the closest position or the position in which the servant is the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the position of sajda. Okay? But even when you look at salat itself, from where it starts, it starts from takbiratul ihram or, you know, actually it starts from way before that, right? It starts with the conditions of prayer and then it starts with adhan and iqama, where when someone prepares themselves. When you go from that point, all the way till the end of Salat, right? There's Qira'at and then there's Ruku and then essentially there's Sajda. I know I'm skipping a lot of details, right? But these are the main positions in, in, in every prayer essentially, okay? So when you start from the beginning and you go all the way to the end, Sajda, being on the ground and having your forehead on the dirt that you were created from, right? And understanding that that was your origin. This is the essentially the very peak of the prayer, Okay, the prayer actually, the, the goal of the prayer is achieved, what scholars say, in sajda. Okay, so much so that when someone is in sajda, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so much so that we have in hadith that when someone goes to sajda and they stay in sajda for a longer uh, while, right, Hadith says, and this is from the sixth Imam, that when he is in sajda and he remains in sajda, nada iblis, iblis calls out. He says, Ya wa ilah, ata'a wa asaitu, wa sajda wa abaitu. He says, I am the one, he, he, he obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he disobeyed me. Wa sajda, and he prostrated to. Iblis calls out. He says, Ya wa ilah. He says, you know, as if something has gone extremely wrong. Ata'a wa asaitu. This one, he obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And me, I didn't obey God. I disobeyed God. What is shaitan talking about? What is Iblis talking about? He's talking about that moment when he was supposed to do sajda. And of course, he didn't do sajda and the whole story that we know about, right? He's saying, essentially, he's seeing that someone else is learning from the mistake that he made. 
and he hates this idea, right? And it hits him in a really, really hard manner that he calls out, Atara wa asaito. I disobeyed, but look at him. He's obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sajada wa abaito. He did sajda, but I didn't do sajda. Right? So essentially, it's so embarrassing for shaitan and iblis when someone goes to sajda. This is the position of sajda. Now, it's interesting because in the dua that we just read, in this line that we just read, that he says, Oh Allah, are you going to take fire? And are you going to put fire over these faces that kharrat li'adamatika sajda, that have fallen to prostration, right? So there's a couple points here. First of all, it says kharrat. Kharrat means when you fall, okay? And it's mentioned in the verses of the Quran a couple times that there are those who, when they see our signs, kharru sujjada. They, they fall to sajda. It's not that they go to sajda. There's a difference here, right? Going to sajda is one thing. Going to sajda is more of a, you know, intentional, you know, okay, now I'm going to go to sajda. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is they have fell to sajda, right? Almost like an involuntary movement. Now, this kharrat sajda, falling to sajda, is what you also find in the hadith of Mi'raj, where essentially the Prophet was taught how to pray. And this, this mi'raj, this ascension towards the sky, one point that some people don't know is that at least some of our scholars say that this happened multiple times. It wasn't one time, right? It was multiple times that it happened. But yes, one of the times that it happened, for example, is where, uh, you know, he was taught the adhan and when he was taught the salat, for example. Now, when you look at that hadith, and it's a very long hadith, and I, want, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but essentially it says that the whole idea of sajda came from where in the fact that we have two sajdas in one prayer is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet, right, that you are to, uh, you know, to go to sajda for me, you are to prostrate to me, and then the Prophet got up, right, he said the dhikr of in the, you know, in the sajda, and then he got up, and then the hadith says, when he raised his head from his sajda, and he sat down, then he looked at the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't know, of course, what the Prophet saw. This time he fell to sajda on his own. Right? He didn't fall to sajda the second time because God told him to. No, he just saw the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fell to sajda again. And then the hadith continues and explains that that's why we have two sajdas in each rak'at. Right? But essentially it shows that this is the very peak, the very climax of the proximity that someone finds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why Imam Ali is touching on this in the first line. He says, are you going to take faces that fell to sajda for you? The same way the the you know the face of the prophet right fell to sajda in in, in mi'raj. Are you going to take faces that fell to sajda for you, and are you going to punish them? We still haven't answered that question. We'll con continue with the du'a and come to an answer to that question, inshallah, in the following episode.